this is the first event uh, sponsored by the, or working in collaboration with the Simone Gad Foundation. Um, some of you know Simone Gad or may have known her, but she was a lovely artist and actor and very beloved in the LA art community. Um, unfortunately, we lost her uh, to cancer a couple years ago. Um, but uh, her, part of her wishes were that she wanted her estate to be dedicated to supporting artists, uh, emerging artists especially, and maybe one set uh, could use extra support in navigating the art world and uh, developing their careers. So this is actually the very first exhibition uh, uh, presented by Fiji Gallery and the Simone Gag Foundation. And Dina Novak, a wonderful artist, is uh, the first recipient. So this is, uh, her show's been up for a few weeks now. This is, uh, we're calling it the closing celebration. Um, so we're gonna have an artist talk, and then uh, later on, we're going to have a wonderful rhythm trance by Greg Ellis. So let me introduce you. This is Greg Ellis on the right here. He's a very well-established and well-known uh, percussionist. Uh, he's done scores for movies. He's traveled the world, traveled and toured, and played with uh, amazing, uh, famous musicians from all over. Uh, but he's also developed uh, some organizations that are about um, kind of exploring music for benefits beyond entertainment. So, you know, the healing properties of music or, um, and even conflict resolution. Um, then we have Dina in the center here, Dina Novak. through every cell of her being, you know, and her, her, that all comes out in her work. So her work is an expression of who she is. Um, she was born and raised in Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the Art Institute. Um, she's a mother, she's raised two children, she's had a very full, colorful life, and uh, she's been very passionately pursuing her art career the past few years. And uh, she has this exhibition, but she's also applying for uh, fellowship programs, for grad school. She's a total go-getter, really inspirational. Um, and then we have Ted Meyer. This is, uh, this is Ted's work. Okay, so that's this is part of us. Uh, Every exhibition, we have an artist influences section. So the artists that influence that group or that solo artist, right? So Dina and Ted have worked together before. Ted is an artist, curator, writer, artist advocate, and a bunch of other things. <laughs> Amazing things. Um, but for over 20 years, he's been working with the medical community and with artists and really creating this bridge of knowledge where you know, the medical community looks at illnesses and, and uh, you know, uh, accidents or whatever in, in a very clinical way. Right? But he brings together that community with artists and how artists express ailments. Uh, injuries or whatever, what, you know, the pains that they're going through. So it's this very different take and a, a very eye-opening experience for the medical community. So it's really beautiful and important work. But he is going to take over now and let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so because I deal with patients who are also artists and people who find motivation in their artwork through different means than maybe the, the normal population, we're going to talk about that. So if you will get a chance to talk about your music and where it came from, you will get to talk about your, your artwork and where it came from. 
but we've had talks, and both of you guys um, say you have some sort of neural divergence. Uh, most people would say uh, Asperger's spectrum disorder, something like that. And um, so I'm just going to go through some basic facts. One out of 54 birth in the United States, somebody is somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, as far as autism, and one out of 250 has Asperger's. And, um, you know, as an artist, people expect you to be a little weird anyway. And so there's so many people that I know and you know as artists who just look at things differently. And I was just wondering, and we're going to start with you, and then we'll get to you. Um, how do you think you see differently than the standard person? What, what, how do you bring a different outlook that maybe there's things that both of you notice because of this slight difference in your physiognomy? The hardest part for me is I really have no idea how a standard person sees it. Yeah. So what, to try and fabricate that and to try and act normal way and not have that kind of weirdness or eccentricity show, show up. Even though I had a talent with music and drumming, I was a performer. I was hired by people. I didn't have any artistry in me. And I, I, my music developed through trying to think of it as normal people would see it and trying to fit it into a box. So I was afraid to make a mistake, I was afraid to go another direction and speak my mind of what I felt artistically what should happen. Um, this has only been an awareness for me in the last year and a half or so, being on the spectrum. And looking back, I think um, it's relieved me in ways of, of feeling like there wasn't something wrong with me, there was just me. It was just who I was. And now as I approach it, I think, I don't feel like I have to be different in any way, but I can let my mind go as far as it needs to. I don't impress my mind. I think that standard view of things, of seeing the world, what I assume a standard way of seeing it is to be entertained by things that most people are entertained by, or like the same thing that most people do. And I'm very specific in what is able to move me. Mm -hmm. So I don't force myself into those situations that I feel uncomfortable of thinking I should be having more fun than I am right now, and I should be enjoying this more than I should be than I am right now. So creating this space for me is something that isn't performance, it's not my job, it's not any part of my career, it's literally the space I keep my sanity. And to be able to do it every few months, I, I did one last week as well, so I've had two now in a week. It, it's a, it's a way of my expression being as free as it can be. So instead of trying to make it what I think you want to hear, I'm trusting if it feels good to me, it's going to feel good to you. And so the only part that is challenging is it may be something you've never heard before. So you know, realize that this is a continuing thing that has a focus and a purpose, it starts making sense. And it's going to really incredible way for me to kind of make sense in my mind and have it make sense to somebody else without having to explain it. Uh -huh. Okay. So, let me ask, so you, I mean, in the, in the definition, these things, they say it's a disorder. I don't, to me it's not a disorder because you guys have both created better art, I think, because you look at things a little differently or you feel things a little differently or sense things a little differently. So why don't you yeah. talk about that? Because when we first met, you would sort of switch styles. And I want to talk about that right now yeah. for a minute. Because I've been thinking about your question a lot lately. And I can only even think about it because I was diagnosed a year and a half ago. And before then, I wasn't even capable of thinking about it. I just kind of, more like Greg said, went through world. Like, I felt like Kramer. Like, I don't know if anyone watched Seinfeld. But like, <laughs> I can go between Tigger, Kramer, and the Buddha all in like the same day. So like, 
the fact that like I didn't really even have the like ability until the diagnosis, all of a sudden it like slowly things kind of trickle down. So I really want to address this. So I've been really thinking a lot about what does it mean and what how is it how can you explain to someone else what it means to be neurodiverse and to do something differently? Well, I started to realize like my actual instinct is not like anybody else's. So for instance, whether it's opening a box that's sealed clearly, I'm not gonna open the seals. I'm going to take my keys and jab at it from all angles. And then I'm gonna get frustrated and I'm gonna look at it. Then I'm gonna, instead of looking at the seals, which I clearly see, I'm gonna avoid them, ignore them. And I'm gonna figure out some weird ass way to open it. And that was the, so as I was watching myself doing this recently, I said, and there is what it means to actually do things differently. Meaning my natural instinct is not going to be the same as other people's. So if I see a closed box, I actually don't want to open it the way it's supposed to be opened. Something about that is rather not appealing for I to do it. It's clearly easier. But there is, in a way, I actually believe that because I don't naturally tune in to like the quote unquote way, it is that exploration to get to opening a box, but I'm gonna do it so dramatically differently than anybody else. And that actually then kind of, I started to say, well, how did that work in painting? And so before I became ill with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a like very kind of somewhat rare collagen disorder, so like all the joints in my body are like, like a rubber band that you just keep pulling, mine don't go back in. So what happened when I was like losing my OT skills, I was a figurative painter. Another person might lose their OT skills and be like, let me try harder, let me try this, or let me, I've seen people paint with like these little whole things and you can like move your hand like this. No, that's, that was like opening a box. I'm like, let's get a bunch of palette knives. Let's like get, you know, a bunch of gloves and let's, we need to create the still life. This is a still life from the same time I was creating figurative work, but now all of a sudden it became much more interesting to me because it was a hunt, it was a challenge. It was get within the box somehow without opening the tape. And to me that kind of like tin pinpoints the way that like naturally I'm not gonna see the same solutions as you or anybody. My daughter's dyslexic and I kind of really see it in her. Like, even what I perceive, she's going to see it a different way. And it's that exploration and seeing things differently that create um, new narratives. It's, what's crea it's what creativity is. I mean, the core of creativity is finding another way to do something. I mean, that is. So I kind of think in a way we're just these vessels full of creativity because really we're like angling a different way. But society really is very good at teaching us that we're all crazy and wrong and there's a disorder to us. Um, that would be basically saying I quit figurative painting because there was a disorder. So I, I should really struggle to paint like I did at 15 or 20 or 30. No, that, that's, that's, not how, that's not how the flow is. So there's this intuitive, once you realize who you are, you're able to kind of harness that. And it's gone from a disorder to being slightly annoying at times. Because there's a lot of times like where we're very gray, probably Greg and I, in our colors and in our tones, I become very black and white in certain social settings or meeting cues. But that's only a very the small hair. The blue hair, that's a very small part. I guess what I'm trying to say is I really thought a lot about how that other angle is and how. It's not that I have to look for the other angle. I naturally find the other angle. So you, you were doing figure to work, and this is so far from that. So was there a, a was it just, well, I have to hold the paint differently, so you started doing things, or did, what, what led to this? This is a big jump from figure to work. Well, the work was starting to, like, I had started to, like, do these series of, like, still lifes, and I found myself much more interested in painting the, t the table at the end of the painting where I would take all the colors and just fill in the book. I was like, oh, I'm really interested in like a quarter of this painting and I've spent two months doing this much. I'm like, and then when I lost my utility skills, I was just like, you know, what if I didn't have to think that way? What if I just like threw that up the, the wall 
And what if I like, instead of ever getting trapped into like thinking how do you paint something, I take all the brushes away so I don't have that to go back to. I replace it with paint and palette knives and this is what you got. Now I'm going back to brushes in a different way though, much more loosely. So you and I were talking about... Um, yeah, you can give them back up on that if you wanted to because you know more than they do. Hmm? About the like, when I quit the figurative to the abstract because Ted had actually oh, talked you to me about that. this. Yeah, you I that. did go. Okay. <laughs> See, that was totally autism. I'm like, I'm going to follow the elf in the room <laughs> to make sure I'm like on track. So you just saw exactly like how it translates. So you and I were talking, and you were saying as a kid, you used to mask this neuro divergence yeah. by, by tapping and things. And I, I just want, you know, I, I really want to get to the difference between sort of just having a short attention span and being like on board to what was going on in your body that you were releasing by tapping all the time as a kid and how that so got you into this. I was, from the earliest, before I could speak, I would repeat this phrase every time, every time I played my mom for hours on end, I would play my Hot Wheels or whatever in the sandbox, whatever it was at our house, and I would go up, 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 constantly. But it'd be under my breath, so and Viva, you know, puck up. Can you give the definition of puck up? Um, how do I explain it? Puck up is like, <laughs> um, I'm getting a Hindi explanation for puck up. That's, I know, that's, that's the puck up. I'm, I'm, that's the, that's the I'm not getting an English explanation for that. Um, how do I translate? Paka is something like something like it's not exactly permanent, but it's like sure. Um, it's I don't know if I'm so saying that, it right. it's it, like it, it, it's all good. Everything's in yeah. Everything. It's it's like um, paka. Um, See, it, actually, you can just say it just by the way you say it. So yeah, yeah. It is a Hindi like, word. Yeah. yeah. But the phrase I do this, I would say. Fast forward 35 years, my first trip to India playing these drums called Madaras, and there's a rhythm called Kerala. That's ka, 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 ka. So it's the exact same rhythm. And the phrase is a Hindi phrase. My attachment to India came completely from my music, but when I ended up there, the sense that this made in me of hearing this rhythm and this phrase sung that way, it was like this, like discovering this thing. So I would be tapping this as well. And so first grade to third grade before I started drumming, and I'm always at this, but they weren't hearing that it was a rhythm, they just thought it was, and that's the difference, so the nervous tap. Mine was, and I hear this rhythm going on, nobody recognized it. My first instrument was trumpet, so I started on the, in, in, in melody, the drums were always there, and then in seventh grade there was a a drum part my junior high band could get, and I was first chair of trumpet, and I'm banging on my foot. I could totally do this, and the music teacher said, you're gonna play the, the snare drum. <laughs> I never played it before, and I go up, the drummers are all mad, because it's like the only drum solo they're hitting these four bars, and I played this perfectly, and I switched to drums, because all, all this, everything was coming out, tapping. I wasn't tapping, drums, there was a rhythm there. And I'm having, now that I, I where and I have students that I've worked with with autism, it, it's made the same sense to them. They're not just minus and tapping. There's a distinction that there's a lot of time a rhythm going on, which means they're hearing something in them that is helping to order this, the disorder in a way. The rhythm yeah. is the math of life, yeah. and I can break it down in ways that get an odd time signature to walking through uh, a crowded sidewalk. There's, there's a rhythm now. Do you have when you were pictures? I, I like his idea of masking this, that he, he was tapping and then sort of masked and he had this. I didn't sort mask. Of this and, and yeah. No, I was much more like just, I was in a really weird little school that was very nurturing, but I was like. Were you different? Totally. Mm -hmm. Like even recently, yeah, yeah, it was really different. Even for like a really weird little school. 
I just kind of like, I don't mask, but I remember like the whole world was in my head. Like, I just like was constantly building things, making things, reading things, and kind of this whole just, I can still remember what it feels like. You're almost just like taking it all in and it just kind of visually accumulates in my head. So for me, it was very visual. And for you, it was beats and vibration. But I think the release is still like, like I feel like the act of the paint is the release. Like for me, the stim is the paint, it's the material. You hear like autistic people stim. So that's true. But even more, like for me, the stim is the dance and the paint, and then the, my special interest is art, <laughs> all types. And then the actual material is the tactile right. sensation to me. So it is hitting those like boxes, and it's definitely organizing my thoughts. Like, there's a lot of chaos, but there's like, and that's where you were saying the path to order looks a lot different than other people's art. You get that. It creates order. Just might not have gotten with other people. So we're talking about a rhythm with you. Like I know when I paint, there's certain music. Like I can listen to Sinatra and the and my brush strokes very yeah. even. Yeah. Do you I do. I have a certain music that I listen to and I can only really I mean, I do paint when I'm quiet, because like when I paint I kind of feel like I do feel like, I wish I could like get a video in my head because I do feel like there's this crazy Rolodex of images and pictures going through, but I also have like very certain music and there's a lot of curves in my music, in my music and that brings out like very feminine, like female vocalists, you know, and like that will bring out, I find like, I also will end up going from like liking one album to one song, so it gets more and more obsessive. <laughs> it starts with like an album of normalcy, and then it's I only can paint this painting to this album, and then it's to a song, and then usually sometime around the end it'll like either resolve or I'll have to get a new song. So do you guys like when you're going to sleep, are you hearing beats? And when you're going to sleep, are you seeing? Images? I see images all the time, and then if I don't see images, I like. I think the biggest thing for me is Instagram. I know people hate social media, but I look at it as a visual like Rolodex to the world and every mark. And so I find that Instagram's really calming. So when I have all the like in my head of the paintings. I'm just like, okay, you're not gonna like resolve it. Oftentimes I'll like take a photo and then I'll alter it. I'm like drawn it, you know, with like a little whatever. But most of the time I'll just like look at a lot of paintings that I'm like, what is it that I'm seeking? And then if I fill my head with images and I do that enough, it percolates somewhere. Nice. I, um, yeah, the rhythms never stop. It can be maddening. I also, aside from the, you know, <laughs> family, every time any mixing bowl or whatever, that's a nice sound. That's why I think about it. <laughs> But um, I drum with my teeth as well. Wait, what so does that mean? I literally, I have a drum set in my mouth and I can, the way I move them inside my head, it sounds, wow. I can work rhythms out in there. So yeah, they have night guards for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's not, uh, it, again, if you saw me do it, if you really looked at you, you'd think there's some weird twitch or something sure. going on. And then I'm just drumming in my head. So the rhythms never stop. Um, when I'm working on a rhythm track. I do a lot of work at home. I do it, I've done hundreds of film scores and video games, TV shows, so I compose will send their work to me at home and I record and layer and a lot of them I work with so I know what they want. So I'm really just kind of free to do, they don't want to send me the track and if I work on it two or three, four hours, you, you have to ingest the music to, to play to it. You can't just throw something on and it's good enough. So it gets in the bloodstream, literally. So that after a session like that, if I'm especially like an all day session, I'll need at least three or four hours at night, no matter what time, just decompress and just try to get it to some kind of sedative rhythm that I can then fall asleep. But it, 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 it's, it's never stopped. I would have migraines when I was younger quite frequently, and I luckily aged out of them to once a year or so. But you know, a couple times a month they were chronic and terrible from very early age. And when I got into music, the, 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 I would have audio like hallucinations. I'd have this thousand channel mixing board where the same song would come up, but each track would be slightly out of tune and slightly out of tempo. Mm -hmm. And so there's this cacophonous sound that is literally, it's, it's And I get visual migraines. 
Yeah, and you do, okay. So, but your visuals, it's interesting, the visuals, and I can see would be the same kind of almost madness and the need to what, do what we do is to somehow make order. I think what's constantly there for me. So how long does a painting like this take you to one behind it? Um, I can't really say because I think like a lot of them are done in like stages. Like so this was done and then it went to like sleep for a year and then it came back alive. So mm -hmm. maybe more would be like maybe like that square one or mm -hmm. I'm thinking well that would um they can go anywhere from like weeks to months, I guess. Like that's months. The one that thick one with that's months and months of oils. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on like they can go for a long time until they're complete. So I will work on a piece until I'm like pretty convinced it's done. And, like I was just talking to a friend, like if it, they're not done, then I'm just decided I'm buying a sander because I need to sand down the oils. <laughs> because like I just, yeah, I constantly like, it's never like, oh, I'm done with that. Let's get a new palette or scrape it off. It's like, no, okay, no, this isn't working, but like, there's all this stuff here. So I'm constantly looking, I'm, I love materials. So how do you like keep creating new language, you know, out of the same things is that, that's, you know, that material exploration. So do you, a painting like this, do you finish it in your head or do you have to be in front of it? Yeah, I don't do anything in my head. It's all like between me, the paint, the intuitive moves. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what the next move is going to be. Um, and one mark leads to the next mark. At a certain point, I'm able to get a grasp of where the painting's going. Like I'm working on a new piece and just least, like almost yesterday, I was able to get a grasp of where to take it. So do you guys want to sit? There's two seats. There's two seats. You want to? Yeah, that's a good idea. I was going to say the same thing. Okay. So while they're while they're sitting, um, I'm going to ask you a question, and it will relate to you. Okay. So in in another one of the videos you were watching, you that I was watching with you, you were talking about sort of nowadays you do a lot of movie sound, soundtracks, a lot of the big. All the big fight scenes, the war scenes, and all movies. the movies I don't watch. <laughs> you're doing the drama sort. Yeah, but you're getting paid for it. Yes, all that matters. Okay, so you were talking about the fact that nowadays people can take little clips and they can take a sampling and put together, uh, you know, a song without a whole band or without things like that. But you're here tonight, and you're going to be doing something for us. So, why don't you talk about? sort of the interaction, how important human interaction is in in music for you. You you make a lot of money doing the other stuff, but you're this is your thing to go around the world and interact with people. And then what he's done, you talk about when people see your paintings and how you relate to them or things they've said to you about the paintings. Uh, it's interesting because I think for the biggest distinction between a, an artist, a, a painter, a visual artist, and, and a musician is that our, our work is done as the result. Like it, it, it's not like, the, 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 we sell a record in the studio work, but when I do a lot of live work, the art is the live performance. So all the preparation um, is like your time in the studio, but it's almost like you prepare the painting, then here's an audience, and I'm going to paint it for you. So there's an immediacy to it that uh, that I find much more intriguing than working in the studio. I mean, the studio is nice, but it, it, there's a lot of manipulation in modern recording, and it's not really this pure like let's get the best take of a song. You're not really capturing the soul of the music, so it can be interesting, you know, creative. But when you're playing live, it's, you, you know immediately what's happening. It's very clear, like if this is getting through, how you're feeling, and all that. So. It's a very different sense of preparation. What Ted is referring to is a, an interview I did where I'm talking about how technology started allowing people to kind of be dishonorable in the art. And at first it was an anger, then it was a judgment, then it was critique. It's complete acceptance now that this is indeed the world we live in. But instead of resisting it or trying to 
collaborate with it, I decided to create a space where at least for an hour you're going to feel nothing but pure sound frequency. It's not even through an amplifier, it's not even through a PA system. Nothing processed. There's absolutely nothing in recorded music you hear today that isn't processed. Some completely, where there's nothing natural in it, like, you know, so if think of any kind of junk food, with all artificial ingredients, we're ingesting our sound, and this, the frequencies go through us. And the same thing with color. Colors resonate, each color has a frequency that has a tonal equivalent and a rhythmic equivalent. So a, a blue resonates at the frequency of G on the piano, and G, then you can find the resonant frequency of that, and have a pendulum resonance that creates a rhythm, so there's a rhythm that's the equivalent to the color and the tone. So a balance in a painting has that same sense of composition balance that can be dissonant, it can be harmonic, it can be melodic, it can be major, it can be minor, right? It's all in that composition of the balance of the colors that are resonating at these frequencies that our body feels. So when you're hearing nothing but electronic sound, electron generated frequency, it's a sine wave. There's no resonant frequency embodied in that sound. There's not a musician whose body is a resonant cavity holding an instrument whose body is a resonant cavity, recording into a microphone whose body is a resonant cavity into a tube preempted. So each step, you have resonance in courage. Now you have no resonance in sound in modern music today. And like I say, it's not a judgment, but it's a nourishment issue. If we were living solely on junk food, which we had been doing, what happened? <laughs> the organic food movement comes in. I've been wanting to find a way to create organic sound, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, verification, just like we do with our food. This is the ingredients. I wonder how much live, is there a live musician on this track? Because the, the, the AI and the virtual reality and all that has been around in drums for 30 years. It's been a drum machine. So it's been fooling us for decades mm -hmm. and making us dance literally to a machine. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do it. I can't listen to music where I know every single thing on there is literally a push of a button. It's just, just like I won't go eat, you know, the crap that is so prevalent everywhere. So we talked about what some me, if I hear auto tune singing, right. it literally right. makes my it's skin crawl. Yeah. It, because yeah. there's, it's not a real sound. It's not a real sound. So why don't you talk about paintings? How people relate them? Well, I don't know how people relate, but um, and I don't, I can't really talk how people relate to my work, so I'm not sure about that. Cats. Cats. I'm not sure how they relate to my work. I can't really understand how I relate to my work. Okay. Um, Frequencies. I mean, what you're saying makes like sense to me, um, but I just I don't know if I'd look at it. I I think there's like a rhythmic music to the colors, mm -hmm. but I don't really understand it in that way. No, of course. Not. It's more intuitive for me. I don't think that hard. I mean, it's just a feeling. It's all feelings for me. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I mean, it's not, I wish I could say it's thought out at all. It's only thought out when I need to solve problems. And then I'm using like my really large knowledge base in oil painting to mm. solve problems. That's interesting. It's all about, but, so basically yeah. to me a painting yeah. is like nothing but solving problems. Right. It's maybe one problem, but they're not negative problems, but they're like, a problem needs to be solved. A problem has to be solved <laughs> until the like, until it works and then it's kind of blocked in. Like, it's no longer solvable, you know? So, but the other thing for me that maybe it relates to is that like a lot of people have said this about my work, a few things. One is that there's an organic flow to my work. So you don't really like, you don't really look at my work and have a sense of like, even with like my mentor's work, David's there, there's a sense of a lot of like stops. With my work, I think there's this, I think there's a musical, Part to they look like music and they look at them I think, sitting yeah, in here. Like but I mean, I think then it goes to the fact that I'm singing and dancing and <laughs> like, and also I mean I do see like I don't know if any of you have ever seen Aurora, the like musician Aurora, the young woman. Anyway, she dances with her hands. Have you ever noticed that? That's actually a form of autistic stimming. Right. So like I never knew why when I was like in the car and doing this, everybody was looking so, at me. Yeah. I'm like in the car like doing this and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so like you just put a brush in that and right. that creates that's there's definitely an internal musical flow that 
the works coming through. Right. Okay, so let's get to your solving a problem. So this canvas is on your wall and it's white. <laughs> What's the problem? The problem is it's white. Yeah. Okay, so how do you how do you start that? Well, you definitely don't start it on the wall. You have to put it on the floor, and oh, then you okay. don't want to like even get a brush because that's too close. So then I like take a big stick. I have these like big bamboo rods that like go there and I put the brush and I like start with just like spilling paint, smearing it. Like that's all the like preliminary dance. And again, like um, the problem is that the biggest problem in art is I'm going to paint a still life. The minute you say I'm going to paint a still life, you've named it. Then you're naming an apple and you're naming the colors. And the more you name things, the less you create and the less possibility for a, a chemical like exploration. So the first thing you want to do is get yourself as awkward and possible to like move in. So I pretty much do everything in my power to solve that problem by putting in that layer in that method. It's so a very when, specific when did, method for when me. You did more recognizable stuff. Did you feel trapped by it? No, I love it? painting. I mean, I love to paint whether I was painting the still life. I was a happy painter. Like, I'm the happiest painter. <laughs> Not a happy person, happy, happy painter. Like, you just put a paintbrush in my hand and it's like, I'm on drugs for as many hours as I'm painting. Except that it's the bad drugs because, you know, the paint's not going well. And then that's where you have to, like, really say, what tools do I have to figure out how am I going to negotiate this to get where I want to go? So let's get back to the idea that you guys have this divergence from what what is baseline. You've been, been all over the world. You've been with all, worked with musicians from, I think, 30 or 40 countries. Do you find more regimentation in this country than, like I, we were talking about being in India, to me that's a country where you can do most anything. But, you know, I, I would think there's still norms people might look at both of you and go, will you fit in here better because it's oh, more variation in what's I think you know, I can, yeah, this is a good one. I can... I didn't say that well, but if you can I get out I can, I, I can, I can describe this way, tie it back to the, is also become analogous, I think, to how our minds work as well, but um, we don't have a legacy of drums in America. And the drums that were here are from people that have been taken away, and their drums have been taken away, too. When the initial slave trade late 1600s, for 50 years, they would, they would allow the, the slaves to bring their instruments and different things from their home, their country. But the drums could communicate, so the slave revolts could happen from one drummers of the same region or same tribe being on different plantations and literally communicate, seven o'clock Monday night, we're here. It's that specific of a language. So there was some big slave rebellion in 1742, the Stonewall Rebellion, which they realized they were communicating through drums. So for 150 years, the drums were illegal. The drums were confiscated. And the, the way to take Africa out of the slaves was to take away their drums. And that was, it was a, not just this form of dance and entertainment. Again. It's, it was a, a literal language and necessity. So when after Jim Crow, when <coughs> slaves were allowed to integrate in Congo Square in New Orleans, every Sunday they would give their drums back and start playing. So where Jasmine was born, this is a whole other history. So America doesn't have a drum culture. Jazz is our indigenous music, essentially, but it's from the freed slaves that created this music. So we have nothing in terms of white Caucasian Americans. So you have to go back. There is, you know, in Scandinavia and British Isles, there's a deep drum history there, but we don't look at it the way we do Africa or India or these places. To... So India has a drum legacy of 3,000 years. So there's a regimen that isn't, like, it's still freedom in it, but you, you play this vocabulary of sounds and rhythms. I'm not talking so much about drums. I'm just talking about 
from different cultures. Well, and that's why I'm yeah. going to equate it to, as opposed to Latin America, where it's like the, the, the rhythms are very regimented, where you don't do any improvisation around it. You have your cowboy part, your clave part, your conga, the, everybody has it. But in Indian music, you learn all this to then create a sense of improvisation. And then you basically show what you don't, what you haven't learned. I'm self-taught, so I don't fit, I'm not a student of this music. So these cultures represent, to me, the way I go in. I, I'm drawn much more to the freedom of improvisation in India than I am to this kind of community gathering aspect of, let's say, Latin America, where the ensemble, you, you, you have to be around people. I mean, you, in India, it's like there's the drummer and the melody instrument, so I can be completely on my own. That reflects part of my neurodivergence, is a difficult time in crowds and loud noises and having to kind of be up with everybody if I'm not feeling it. That team player. In sports, you know, all I did was solitary sports and never team sports because I couldn't have that demand to be that same kind of energetic level. So India has a much smoother way of, of, of their culture that works in India. It doesn't translate outside of India. So when you're there and you're not trying to, you know, adapt it through your own sense of culture where you're from and re release to it, it's just a river flowing for me. Where Japan, I love that level of order where it's also not uh, contained. It's, it's, it's a, a beauty of perfection that is just so incredibly disciplined. Like it doesn't feel rigid, you know? So I think that's where I kind of get the sense of culture through the music and stuff. Or do you find different groups that you're more accepting than, than not? That are more accepting. Travel? Well, I traveled a lot, but um, I mean, to me, I, I think um, the groups that I, I think it's not that I'm accept. I think well, I think it's more who's accepting of me. That you know, um, I mean, I can mask really well, so it's like I can pretty much like get along with anybody first pretty much as long as I want to, but the minute I'm done with them, it's like the mask just falls. And that's like kind of hard in a way. And the other thing is like, I find my comfort around academics and artists because I'm very academic and I've had a like, that's part of just like, my brain loves to learn and love school. Just that was like my sweet spot. I love teaching. And then the other part is like, being around artists who are a lot more like me. We kind of speak a similar language. Like uh, a kind of funny analogy, somebody I know posted online and it's not even someone I know well, but we connected and like artists connect on Instagram kind of like in a different way. It's, it's very like you're seeking out your tribe. And if you find them, you're like, bing, 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 you're part of the tribe. And so like, so this guy's part of the tribe and I'm part of the tribe and he puts up this thing and this isn't really like, I think pure autism and drive. He's like, who works hard? And I'm like, and he goes, who wants to compete with me? I'm like, oh, competition, yes, I love that. <laughs> like nothing more fun than like a good competition, like who's gonna be more productive? Like, <laughs> I love that. Like, I love that. I love drive, I love competition. I'm mm, Capricorn, so it's like, an autistic driven, it's kind of like all those things, so where it makes the most sense is in the arts. Like it doesn't make as much sense in business, plus like, you know, like you said, there's an element of like you're smiling and you're smiling and finally you're like, oh, I'm gonna fall on this chair, you know? And so we can't mask as much. We don't have the same tolerance. And that is not a positive. There's no way I can even make that one look like a positive. So other than your, your <coughs> want to start continuing your education, maybe get a master's? Definitely get a master's, MFA. What else would you paint? Do you have well, a direction for your painting? Well, the MFA is really important. I want to talk about that. You did some stats, which is like one in 54 people are autistic, but only the percentage of autistic professors, even though many of them probably are, those who are quote unquote out, the numbers are unbelievably low. So the other part is I really driven, like it's multiple, it's the paintings and the teaching and also like the mentoring. I really wanna be out there as like 
an open, neurodiverse painter, professor, because I think like it's a really hard road and a lot of our students don't know the path. And there's a lot of heartbreak and just negotiating. And I just feel like we need to have people, we don't need opportunities, we actually need placements. There are opportunities, but there has to be openness that people are like coming saying, I am autistic, it's not a negative, it's a positive. So let's talk about that for a second, because most people think of autism, they think of people, severe cases where people don't talk, they never look you in the eye, but you've told me a number of times that you love teaching. I mean, that's really sort of an intimate interaction with somebody. So when you talk about how you have sort of this set of symptoms, and that's the thing about a lot of the artists I've dealt with with illness, they come at it from depending on what the illness is or what their experience was, That's a really all cool. different directions. I think it's that, like, for instance, if I walk into a classroom, like, I taught my whole life. Like, I've never done anything but teach art and to little kids, high schoolers, and then make art. But I always notice, like, when I come in the classroom, it's, like, initially overwhelming. They're loud. They're annoying. But it's, like, there's this act of love. And I think that also because, like, just because initially I might see a classroom that way, my ability to intuitively, so here's another thing. So when you're on the spectrum, I'm basically seeing patterns everywhere. I'm a pattern making machine. I can, I can, I can look at your Facebook page, take three things and pretty much like, it's all pattern, pattern recognition. So what I'm doing as a teacher is I'm recognizing the patterns of my students and over time, because I always taught in small classes, it's just a relationship of mentoring. Like they used to say, you know what color we'll pick before we do. You know, it's like I'm intuitively over that period of time relating this relationship with each student. And it's incredibly meaningful. And as a mother with an autistic daughter and a dyslexic daughter, like I don't think that I'll, I always actually have to say, I used to wonder what my daughter thought because she was autistic. I would spend nights wondering what did the autistic brain think like. And I was like, it just thinks like you and I. It loves, it hates, it has feelings, it sees chaos, but, but it has a lot of gifts and incredible empathy, incredible pattern recognition, incredible patience, incredible ability to see how to pull potentials. I'm going to ask one more question, and if any of you guys have questions for them, you, you are free. So, can you guys imagine a life where you are not doing music and you are not painting? Like, what would you can you Because you're both kind of driven obsessively. <laughs> I mean, I, I, the alcoholic gene is in my family, and uh, you know, it's the only, actually the migraines are a saving for my too, because I've got such Terrible migraines, the hangover would be like, why would I do something so terrible? So I said, I didn't have, really, I stopped drinking since I was like 20. And, but my brother, my dad, my cousins, this saved me in a way, I think, of, uh, of that route. So I don't think it would have been, you know, to say if I wouldn't have wanted to live, but I think I definitely would have been heavily sedated if I had to function outside of this world. Would you? I would have been homeless, there's no doubt. Yeah. I was like a red flag missing machine for 50 years. And you throw in a good dose of attraction and charm and you're basically red meat on the world. And so the, the thing I always knew was like, yeah, you can't get like caught up in that because like you have this to give. And it was just the day I decided to do it was the day I decided to do it. I was like, I can't waste my time. and. Now I don't really think a lot about what other people think. So when you ask those questions, they're not that relevant to me that often because I frankly, I mean, I don't have a lot of like, it's not that I don't care, but it's like, I know who I am. I know where my art's going and where it's leading. And I invite all the people to come with me, but I don't have to like question where that path is anymore. I, I think the black and white thinking of the autism and the obsessive nature, that once I decided to do something, it was like, whoo, watch out, because it's like, it almost can burn you to death, or it's going to like propel you to greatness. Yeah, exactly. It's going to fry you to pieces, or it's going to be your superpower.
And I think it's my superpower. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I'm just a channel. It can't come from me because I'm really not able to do that. I mean, I bring something to it. But I have a joke. I mean, I'm Jewish, and so in our religion, it's called Hashem. It means God, and I always like. I kind of feel like I'm in a conversation with the divine. So it's not just dancing, but it's literally a conversation with the divine. And I don't really know what that means, but it's the divine of some sort. Do you feel that way? I yeah, I think it's uh, it's back to the frequency thing. To me, I feel tuned into a frequency, like a radio frequency. I mean, if you pull up in your car, you're listening to the same station as somebody else, and you, they pull up and they have that resonance. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like this, this big That this feels happens. good. I yeah, like that. Exactly. That happens in the pain where this like frequency connects and this bigness happens. Right, and that's and so it's like it's, it's in the, the, the tube of the wave and surfing is it's a very similar experience, and it's a flash there. Yeah. But it's that kind of engulfing, being engulfed, yes. but not being smothered. I think <laughs> so. that, like, if any of you are athletes or you go into the <coughs> world, there's anything that can get you in that, I mean, we're pretty much addicted to it. Yeah, exactly. So we live in, we want that all the time. <laughs> are there, are there any routines that you have that helps you move into that flow? Painting every single day. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I just sit there, I spray paintings, but luckily mm -hmm. I have my good music. But I show up every day. I mean, you, it's a job. It's not magic. I can't, it's not magic. I often post the early, messy middle and the end. And people are like, well, why do you show that? I'm like, because it's not magic. Yeah, yeah. If I just post the end, people are like, oh, she's just magical. No. That's very true. The, the, the work aspect is, is yeah, it's, it's, you can't fake that. So wherever it comes from, there is no divine path that once you tap into this and you're just like, you know, dancing around and... Yeah, then it's all work. Dancing for five minutes. That's when the work starts, right? Yeah, and then you're like working for eight hours. <laughs> so, you know, to get you into the metaphor, it's like, you know, the, the tube is... You get out, but you got to paddle out and paddle in. I mean, the work is, is for those few seconds of that thing that makes sense. So I find if I have that moment and something, I can grasp it and especially my own composition, I work with it for hours sometimes, but if I end at night and I go check it in the next morning, like, like what the hell was I thinking? This sucks. <laughs> and, and it does sometimes, but a lot of times it's just marinated differently and I have to like, a dominant spice has come out that it's like, well, maybe that's it. So I'll mute other things and take the theme that I thought was the submissive aspect of it and now that's the theme I, I work with and it all makes sense again. So. Just one last question sure. for me. Uh, when you create, uh, like, do you differentiate what comes from the heart and the feeling and what comes from the mind? Because I assume you use both or, or not. I mean, for me, it's like, again, you have to understand, like, I was recently, like, listening to Elon Musk speak about being bullied. And, like, I recently was, and I was thinking, like, what is that link? It's because, like, I think when you're, like, speaking both from the mind and the heart, you can hit both ways. I think people on the spectrum, we're speaking from the mind, but our, at least for me, the mind is, it uh, has an ability to understand a lot of different things, like whether it's music or whether it's medicine, like, there's this openness in the thinking that, like, it's both. It's feelings. But again, it's not just feelings, it's coming with a huge background and ability for your mind to analyze things, wouldn't you say? I think it's a similar thing, that the mind and body connection, it becomes one thing, and yeah. it's like this resonance that's, yeah. that's one thing now. And, that's it. And you can, like again, you can skate it for a bit, but it's like, it's gonna close out on you, and it's like, they're separate again. So now I'm thinking in my head, and I'm yeah. feeling this, right? It's, it's like, both, I it's the same yeah. thing, and it works best when they're together. And yeah, that's what we're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> All right, back here. Not the guy who just walked in. Yeah. No, oh, I just had a question of, of this painting, the homage to Bernard. Yes. And I know, I'm sorry, you can't see it, but uh, it's 
your, your, your paintings are so vibrant, mm -hmm. so vibrant with, the, with color, and this one is a little bit more muted. Yeah. And is, is there a, a reason, was it because of the subject? or? No, I, I was, it's because I think that's what I'm looking towards working with. Oh, okay. That's my most recent painting, and oh, I don't think it's a slight deviation from the whole group. Wow, oh, okay. I was just, it just it has to do with like trying to find, like, I'm not going to just stick with hot colors. I'm looking for more no, and more no, language okay. and like how to make, like, what I like about that is like, in a lot of these, it's just like pop, pop, pop. But yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. This one's a little But in more. this one, you get this like, because there's so much brown, so the more neutrals you put in, then when you pop it, you get these kind of really like yeah. singing little pieces. I, I just felt that this was yep. among, amongst your work here, a little bit more, I, I felt a little more attuned to it. Maybe not just because I'm sitting here. Maybe because, <laughs> but, but, no, it's really good because it's my most recent okay, piece. And you. I've been thinking more about like, I mean, I think a lot about color and how to move it forward. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. I appreciate it. Do you guys receive uh, information from uh, other places such as the, the dreamscape? I mean, your bed and mm. I don't dream. acknowledge, your, acknowledge your dreams and then what? No, I wish, I know I dream because sometimes I wake up and I'm still dreaming, but I don't remember my dreams. I, uh, so I'm also, and I know you, you are too, an advocate for, of cannabis, and um, it's helped me immensely in so many aspects, and it's the one thing that I use medicinally in that way, but if I travel and don't have it, it the, the, the pot also subdues the dream. That's why so I don't dream. That's why I don't dream. And so when, you tra when I travel for, it, it's usually here for about five or six days, and then it's just the, these dreams that are just epic dreams and side dreams of side dreams and it's always like these espionage checkpoints and things that are just wow. I wake up just exhausted and they're, they're incredibly layered so the pot also helps me sleep because I don't dream as much but the dreams I don't get information from them they're, to me I'm just they're just fascinating to me that my mind can even like can create all these layers but the waking up inside a dream inside a dream I've got that too that's even now um like, yeah. So I want to show. So I have this very genetic disease that anybody who has my disease is either mostly on opiates. So I don't. So you just smell like a skunk. But it's <laughs> incredibly helpful. Like when I met Ted a couple years ago, I was really struggling to even like just my like physical being, and I was able to like paint this in eight months. So I'm a huge fan of this. But I don't think. Yeah, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> so maybe that answers that. <laughs> but if we, like he said, you know, he, he, he had these vivid dreams, and uh, it, it obviously it, it creates a certain type of emotion, then you, you take that, you know, from the dreamscape and then you transfer it and transmute it into your plane. No, I think I'm, I'm similar to Dina. I, since I'm self taught, I don't have this kind of technical foundation I start with. Like if I'm playing, and I play all the all my all the instruments, anything I can find tunings and keys, and but I can, can't tell you what key any of my pieces are in. Um, it, it, it's, it happens when I do it. I don't I don't enter in. I'm not entering into here with a vision of what I'm going to do. That's that's basically the composition. I don't have to do. I can look at that and it's like you guys don't hear it. I know exactly what that sounds like. So I'm going to show you what it sounds like to me. But I, I have no sense of what that's going to be. In terms of like taking something from another source and trying to apply it literally to it. I really let the sound, like the colors, kind of guide the way in that sense. So. Because what you get mentioned that you pull from another source. But from, just because it's a song doesn't mean I under remember it. I feel it. And that I feel. I don't have a knowledge point of God or the divine or the goddess or the. I don't know, there's so many names for everything, but I feel it, so I don't have to have a name. I mean, I know it's not coming from me, um, and even if it is coming from my Rolodex of information, again, even with my narrow diversity, I'm still a human. Like, the act of creativity is a pretty heavy act, so <laughs> if something's leading me, and all of these artists, I've been here. Yeah. And it's channeled through you, so... 
Yeah, but I put something into it. For yeah, sure. definitely. Well, I, think, I think there's a legacy and a lineage of, of that frequency of what we do. That mm -hmm. if anybody who does anything creative, that's ch you're channeling that same frequency you're channeling through. So, not literally like a source of divine. Right. I don't know. It's not literally the divine. It's like the present. I don't know. It's, you know, it's the art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. That's the whole thing. On that note, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, wait, 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 one, one, yep. one more uh, uh, question, actually. Uh, it was spoken while I was outside, apologies, but I wanted to ask Ted, um, who's been an incredible moderator, if you would share with us some of your work and maybe touch upon uh, your experience and uh, uh, your human experience and then your artistic well, I was, I, I was going to say to wrap up, so my work <laughs> is, is about working with people that have some sort of difference, whether it's a heart transplant, cystic fibrosis, people who sort of explain how they are different medically, the experiences they've been through. And with both you guys and, and all these other people I work with, I think they produce better work because they've gotten in touch with their life story. And as a result, you know, when you were doing figurative work, but the way I see, and I could be completely wrong, you weren't as in touch with everything going on with you. And now you're doing this amazing work. I do, when I give speeches, I show before and after work for first because I find the new work, once she's gotten in touch with herself, so much more powerful, you know? And I think when you guys, you know, if you have friends with autism, you have a friend who's had a heart attack, so once people get through it and they get the strength from realizing who the new person is, to me, sometimes they just emote so much better. And I think both you guys are proof of that. So uh, thank you for letting me interview you. And thank now we're going to hear some great music and yeah. look at the, the art. And we have pizza also. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs>